Welcome to the Deadly Addictions channel. Today I'm going to be talking about skepticism. Now this could turn into a four to five hour podcast, so I'm going to try to make this quick. Also, I guess I'll begin with epistemology, which is the theory of knowledge, especially with regards to its methods, validity, and scope. Epistemology is the investigation of what distinguishes justified belief from opinion. Now, I'm a big, um, you know, fan of philosophy and learning certain things about different aspects of life, especially when you go back in time and, you know, you're, you're comparing the time people were living to the breakthroughs they were having and understanding human nature and human the, the mind. And like I said, this could be a five hour podcast and people do it way better on the internet. You can find them. You can get really in depth stuff. A lot of these things are me just giving a really like, you know, shining a light on things and how they relate to me. As always, I'll try to put the links in the description. Um, particularly one article I want to read and these little things I might leave out, but they're just like little descriptions. Um, we can go to the Stanford Encyclopedia of um, Philosophy, which is insane. Like I said, you can read these things for days. But, you know, when it starts with epistemology, it starts with the cognitive success, and it keeps going on, and you get to know um, the way people understand knowledge and how we per uh, perceive things and infer things, and how just how weird our minds are and how they work. But you're getting into what is knowledge. Knowing is the many kinds of cognitive success that epistemology is interested in understanding. And, you know, we look at the things like we know individuals or knowing how. Um, Gilbert Ryle argued that knowing how to do something must be different from knowing any set of facts. No matter how many facts you might know about swimming, Say it doesn't follow from your knowledge of these facts that you know how to swim. And of course, you might know how to swim even without knowing very many facts about swimming. And you know, it just gets deeper, like I said, knowing facts. And what are facts? I mean, epistemology just gets insane. But for me in my life and how I like to have parameters, so I like to know about these things and you know how to, once I know the parameters of things like, and how skepticism is in philosophy, and how radical you can get with it. No, I don't want to question reality and, uh, you know, am I a brain in a jaw every day? That's not the purpose of it for me. I do understand the mental exercise of going there, though, and understanding the limits of our sensory, you know, uh, inputs and how we perceive things and logic and critical thinking all these things i try to dabble in to get an understanding to get an informed opinion and this way i better i could better navigate my life i could better navigate the corridors of my own mind being as someone who went through a lot of things recently and i'm not special or different from most people and i just happen to have a couple of things in my life that put me on to certain paths and one was um, meditation, and then it was, you know, uh, philosophy, let's say, and it was a psychology, human behavior, and for over 30 years, I've just been fascinated with it. Uh, so, like I said, epistemology, this is kind of like the beginning of it, and I'll get into um, uh, skepticism now. Uh, let's just go right off the bat and see what... Uh, you know, what they're going to say. Okay, so skepticism. One, an attitude of questioning, disbelief, or doubt. Two, in philosophy, to position that certainty and knowledge can never be achieved. David Hume made skepticism a cornerstone of his system and provoked much later discussion when he taught that sensory experience provides no sure basis for knowledge of the external world and that nothing can be proved by observation. 
Causation, for example, is only an inference that relates to observed events. And one has no knowledge that this relationship will apply in similar cases. It is a generalization that could be proved wrong by a different result. In modern philosophy, postmodernism, post structuralism, <laughs> oh, shit, uh, post structuralism, and deconstruction are essentially systems of skepticism. All right. What else do we got here? Uh, skepticism. Knowledge. Is it possible? Skepticism in epistemology is the belief that some or all human knowledge is impossible. See, since even our best methods for learning about the world sometimes fall short of perfect certainty. Skeptics argue it is better to suspend belief than to rely on adutable products of reason. Discardes and methodical, uh, myth, methodical skepticism. <laughs> uh, shit. The first great philosopher of the modern era was René Descartes, whose new approach won him recognition by some as the progenitor of modern philosophy. Descartes' pursuit of mathematical and scientific truth soon led to a profound rejection of the scholastic tradition in which he had been educated. Much of his work was concerned with the provision of a secure foundation for the advancement of human knowledge through the natural sciences. Fearing the condemnation of the church, however, Descartes was rightfully or rightly cautious and publicly expressing the full measure of his radical views. The philosophical writings for which he is remembered are therefore extremely circumspect in their treatment of controversial issues. After years of work in private, Descartes finally published a preliminary statement of his views in the Discourse on the Method of Rightly Conducting the Reason, 1637. Since mathematics had generally achieved the certainty for which human thinkers yearn, he argued, we rightly turn to mathematical reasoning as a model for progress in human knowledge more generally, expressing perfect confidence in the capacity of human reason to achieve knowledge. Descartes proposed an intellectual process no less unsetting, unsettling than the archi architectural destruction and rebuilding of an entire town. In order to be absolutely sure that we accept only what is generally certain, we must first deliberately renounce all of the firmly held but quest questionable beliefs we have previously acquired by experience and education. Now that's important. Of course, I fucking up, but I want to read that again. In order to be absolutely sure that we accept only what is generally certain, we must first deliberately renounce all of the firmly held but questionable beliefs we have previously acquired by experience and education. I'll continue. The progress and certainty of mathematical knowledge, Descartes supposed, provided an immutable model for a similarly productive philosophical method, characterized by four simple rules. Immutable? <laughs> But immutable, I said. I immutable, I shall elucidate. Four simple rules. One, accept as true only what is indubitable. Two, divide every question into manageable parts. Three, begin with the simplest issues and ascend to the more complex. Four, review frequently enough to retain the whole argument at once. This quasi-mathematical procedure for the achievement of knowledge is typical of a rationalistic approach to epistemology. In this context, Descartes offered a brief description of his own experience with the proper approach to knowledge. Begin by renouncing any belief that can be doubted, including especially the testimony of the senses. Then use the perfect certainty of one's own existence 
which survives this doubt as the foundation for a, a demonstration of the providential reliability of one's own faculties generally. Significant knowledge of the world, Descartes supposed, can be achieved by only following this epistemological method. Epistemological. <laughs> ah, this is fucking fun. The rationalism of relying on a mathematical model and eliminating the distraction of sensory information in order to pursue the demonstrations of pure reason. Later sections of the discourse, along with the supplementary scientific essays in which it was published, trace some of the more significant consequences of following the Cartesian method in philosophy. Descartes' me mechanistic inclinations emerge clearly in these sections with frequent reminders of the success of physical explanations of complex phenomena. Non-human animals, in Descartes' view, are complex organic machines, all of whose actions can be fully explained without any reference to the operation of mind and thinking. In fact, Descartes de declared that most of human behavior, like that of animals, is susceptible to simple mechanistic explanation. Cleverly designed autonoma could successfully mimic nearly all of what we do. Thus, Descartes argued, it is only the general ability to adapt to widely varying circumstances, and in particular, the capacity to respond creativity, creatively in the use of language, that provides a sure test for the presence of an immaterial soul associated with the noble human body. But Descartes supposed that no matter how human-like an animal or machine could be made to appear in its form or operations, it would always be possible to distinguish it from a real human being by two functional criteria. Although an animal or machine may be capable of performing any one activity as well, or even better than, we can, he argued, each human being is capable of a greater variety of different activities than could be performed by anything lacking a soul. In special instance of this general point, Descartes held that although an animal or machine might be made to utter sounds resembling human speech in response to specific stimuli, only immaterial thinking substance could engage in the creative use of language required for responding appropriately to any unexpected circumstances. My puppy is a loyal companion, and my computer is a powerful instrument, but neither of them can engage in a decent conversation. And it just gives you a great view on, you know, how the people's minds were. And as someone who doesn't believe in su supernatural and spirits and gods and whatever, you can see the frame of mind and references that he uses here. So that's one of the, um, basically, what is this from? Uh, I don't know. If I'm, what is this? Oh, this is from Lumen. Uh, Learning.com. LumenLearning.com. It's like a little thing on courses they give. And um, so here's an article from Fearless Culture. Right, this one I can give credit for. The other ones are like, you know, like, um, you know, knowledge things and like you learn. What is this? Uh, yeah, Fearless Culture. Certainty can cripple your wisdom. Skepticism can help you find new answers. Oh, I thought this was going to give me... Um, Oh yeah, okay. I think I will. Okay, I think it's by Gustavo Rossetti. Okay, yeah, I like getting credit to people. I mean, I'm reading their fucking work. All right, I'll begin. A young man caught a small bird and held it behind his back. He then asked, "Master, is the bird I hold in my hands alive or dead?" He thought this was a grand opportunity to play a trick on the old man. If the master answered dead, the young man was planning to set the bird free. If the master answered alive, he would simply wring its neck. The master spoke. The answer is in your hands. Certainty is a trap. It makes us feel in control, even if we have to deceive others. The young man didn't care about the master's answer. He wanted to be in control. The young man was willing to kill a bird to be right. 
We want life to go according to our plans. We wish to know what will happen next. However, life is out of everyone's control. Your craving for certainty can derail you from experiencing life as is. The certainty mindset, wanting to have the truth, can stop you from growing as a person. Rather than discovering life, you get stuck in what is familiar. The world is fluid and unexpected. Life is always a surprise. You don't need certainty, but to be open to challenging your truths. The path for personal discovery to seeing life sharply. Certainty can cripple your life, and is a quote. Those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. Voltaire. Being certain doesn't mean that you have the right answer. The mind is incredibly adverse to uncertainty and ambigu ambiguity. Ambiguity. <laughs> when we don't know something, we create our own reasonable explanation. According to cognitive science, we prefer to hold on to these invented justifications than to admit we don't know what happened. By the way, I'll say this, I say this a lot as I'm talking, and if I put links, a lot of these articles have highlighted words, underlying words, in their links. So, here where it says according to cognitive science, you can go hit the link. Having an answer is not correlated to seeing life sharply. Social psychologist Ari Kruglansky oh, Ari, Ari Kruglansky coined the term cognitive closure, which is also on the line, to describe our aversion toward ambiguity and uncertainty. We prefer having an answer as quickly as possible than to, do, to discover the truth. During times of fear and anxiety, the need for cognitive closure increases. Studies have demonstrated that after terrorist attack, society feels an urge to find who's responsible. Fear feeds rumors and fake versions. People share stories without any validation. The desire to punish someone gets everyone out of control. It becomes okay to accuse the first apparent suspect. Being under attack rapidly affects our logic. Anyone is guilty until proven innocent. Not the other way around as it should be. That's how the desire for certainty can cripple our lives. The need for closure makes you see the world in black and white. You simply close your mind to new information. Skepticism doesn't mean fighting reality. <laughs> Quote, Do you want to know what my secret is? I don't mind what happens. Jidhu Krishnamurti Jidhu Krishnamurti Trying to find an answer is not wrong. Being blinded by the need for quick resolution is the problem. When we overreact, things get out of, con out of hand. The medicine becomes more dangerous than the disease we're trying to cure. The opposite to the need for closure is skepticism. Rather than taking the first answer for real, you challenge the truth. You don't let irrational fear dictate your answers. Skepticism is not nihilism or being negative. It's adding an extra filter. Rather than taking anything for granted, you want to validate the truth. You don't take social constructs as true no matter how strong peer pressure is. The need for certainty can shape your perception. Your own stories cloud reality. You don't do it on purpose, of course. We all fall victims of the mind tricks. Challenging your own beliefs requires training your mind. Alright? Let's say that again. Challenging your own beliefs requires training your mind. Developing a critical mind will prevent you from taking the social constructs, rumors or not, for valid. That's how rumors get started in the office. One person creates a story and shares it with two different people. Then they wait and see. 
When someone listens a similar story coming from two different sources, the rumor is validated. Being skeptical doesn't mean being rigid, dogmatic, hypercritical, or obtuse. You simply understand that you cannot react to the first answer. You want more evidence before buying into it. Skepticism is not denialism either. Anything is possible, or not, until proven the contrary. Challenging a theory is how new lines of thinking are created. If you believe that one idea is an absolute truth, you don't leave room for incremental improvement. You can be a skeptic without being a cynic. Cynicism is distrusting most information you see or hear, especially when our beliefs are being challenged. Cynics are tricky. They have a strong argument to debunk other people's ideas, but have little support to justify their beliefs. Cynics are intolerant. They have inflexible thoughts that leave no room for additional ideas. Skepticism is not thinking that beliefs are wrong, but that they may be wrong, as I wrote here. There are two types of skepticism, negative and positive. By removing bad ideas, negative skepticism allows good ones to flourish. Positive skepticism skepticism goes beyond the removal of false claims. The Greek word skeptikos means thoughtful, while the need for closure is a reaction in the heat of the moment. Being skeptical, skeptical is less impulsive. It requires inquiring and reflecting. Positive skepticism fuels critical thinking. It encourages you to get a deeper understanding of events or things. Instead of taking the truth for granted, you question it first. The truth will set you free. The truth will set you free, but first it will make you miserable. Jim Davis, that's a quote. A need for certainty might overshadow facts. People who are certain of an opinion are more likely to act on it. The elections are a great example. When people are confidently in favor of candidate X, they are more likely to vote for that candidate than someone who is uncertain, even though they support the same candidate. The surer someone believes he she is right, the harder it is to persuade that person that he, she might be wrong. When people feel sure, it's harder to change their minds. Certainty can get you stuck in a position. You shut down to new alternatives. You have the freedom to choose, but the truth is not optional, right? Neurologist Robert Burton argues that certainty is not a conscious choice, nor a thought process, but a sensation. It's the feeling of knowing. Like anger or fear, it doesn't rely on a deep state of knowledge. The author author explains how most times we are wrong even when we're convinced we are right. Ulrich Neisser, the father of cognitive psychology, conducted the Challenger study to question what he called flashbulb memories. How shocking emotional events leave a vivid imprint on the mind. Students were asked how they'd heard about the disaster, where they were, what they were doing at the time, etc. Nessia collected information the day following the incident. He repeated the experiment three years after. Students expressed a high levels of confidence that their false memories of the explosion were more accurate than the descriptions they had written down one day after the explosion. One student commented, That's my handwriting, but that's not what happened. (laughs) The autonomous rational mind is a myth. The answer, Burton argues, lies in accepting the limits of our ability to know and in playing by the rules of scientific method. The concepts of the self and free will are innate useful fictions that allow us to function. As Samuel Johnson said, all theory is against the freedom of the will. All experience is for it. Modern neurophysiology tells us our decisions are made subconsciously before we are aware of deciding. The way of the skeptical mind. Ah, there's a familiar quote name. In order to seek truth, 
it is necessary once in the course of our life to doubt, as far as possible, of all things. Rene Descartes Embrace positive skepticism. Turn challenging truth into a habit. Once again, I'm not asking you to become a cynic and distrust everyone. Positive skepticism is about finding the other side of the story, to understand where the sources and analysis are impartial. Listen to both sides of a story. Look for heterogen heterogeneous generous so hetero <laughs> heterogeneous sources. Set your conclusions aside before read all the information. Ask what if to explore different hypotheses. What if? Oh shit, that's the Marvel weekly uh podcast I'm doing. Check out my playlist, or like, share, blah, 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 blah. Avoid reacting as mobs do. Most crowds belong to an identifiable group. The collective beliefs dictate the crowd's action. Fear and anxiety erase logic and rationality. All the mob cares is to find a scapegoat. Beliefs blind individuals. When the mob is blind, the behaviors are even more damaging. Try to calm the mob before things go out of hand. Be open to change your mind. It's okay to believe something and then, after reviewing the facts, realize that either you are wrong or your memory was playing tricks. Like it happened to the participants of the Challenger study. Changing your mind is wise. People who get stuck to what they believe is true, they stop learning. Turn challenging truths into a healthy habit. Continually, continually question the truth, especially yours. There is never a 100% guarantee that we are right. Burton suggests we use the words, I believe, instead of, I know. And that's a long debate I used to go into years ago. Admitting that your truth is actually a belief set you free. It becomes easier to challenge your interpretation of real events. Adopt a maybe mindset. The world is uncertain and continually mutating. What was right yesterday will not be okay tomorrow. Scientists are constantly discovering new theories that debunk previous ones. The same happens with life events. What seems positive today might unexpectedly turn into negative tomorrow. The truth is provisional. Adopt a maybe mindset, as I explained here. We don't control life events. Life is about discovery, not about being certain. Being skeptical will prevent you from taking things for granted. You will see life sharply. I love that article. That's why I chose it for the end. And again, I'm not an expert on these things. I just dabble in and I get an informed opinion in areas, whether it be epistemology, philosophy aspects, and, you know, ontology. It just it gets crazy, I know. But trying to be a critical thinker, being skeptical at times, in moderation, not being too radical like it explains, is a good thing. We would have much less people being conned over the phone. Uh, the family savings is gone. And yeah... There are people who are just good at their trade. I try to explain to people, you know, a criminal or something. There are probably criminals who are good at what they do. But the human mind is very nuanced and tricky. And that's one thing I've always tried to understand about myself and to impart some knowledge on people who might come across my podcast. Facebook is filled with these fucking uh, zany, loony fucking beliefs. And it's it spreads it you know you can get into looking into memes and all these type of things but you have an understanding if you do know about the scientific method if you do know a little about a little bit about what skepticism is and to be skeptical or to be radical skeptical in philosophy you know and how we could just be critical thinkers and improve our lives as i described before it helps to know the parameters and when I read people like Dan Dennett and Sam Harris and, uh, you know, how the brain works and the different philosophies and the way they look at things, 
I want to know as much as I can. I don't have to stay five years studying one aspect of it. But if I know enough and I can get enough information, even that I can't trust. But it gives me what I call an informed opinion. In any case, I hope people enjoy this. This is fun to do. This one's going to be a little... Oh, I guess I guess gave some easy um, descriptions. But this is the link I'll put into the, uh, the descriptions because I really love this article. The things like this that really um, get me thinking. And I think that's the whole point of it. And as I said, a lot of these are just what it means to me. You can go on YouTube, do searches. There are many uh, topics out there. And you can listen for hours. You can listen to lectures for hours on this stuff. So, um, you can check out my playlist. I have uh, a bunch of different plays, playlists if you're into like TV and movies. And a lot of the stuff I do borderlines on science and mental health. So, I have the sciences and also the foundations for wellness. And I think I'll attach this to both of those for j just in case of reference. But I do have a three habits for critical thinking type um, podcast I did a while ago. Anyway, check it out. You know what to do. I appreciate everybody. I hope everybody's doing well. My best to you and yours.